Um, for those of you that I didn't meet yesterday, I'm Judy Pearsall, Editorial Director for Dictionaries at Oxford University Press within the Global Academic Division. Um, welcome to this first main session of the OED Symposium, a day given over to discussing ideas and the future of the OED. Thank you very much for coming and thank you already for all of your contributions your enthusiasm, your engagement over the past few months. It's been absolutely fantastic. And this is a really special time for us at OUP to listen to you as leading international specialists across a broad range of fields which touch on the OED either directly or in some cases quite indirectly. Um, it's a chance for you, uh, for us to listen to your thoughts and perspectives and it's a chance for you to share your ideas with us, but also with the other um, participants. We're really looking forward to lots of lively debate. We don't expect to agree on everything, or maybe not on very much at all. Um, but, and we don't always know what will happen next, and that's the really exciting part of today. But we know there's going to be plenty of food for thought um, that's going to happen in the days and months following today. Uh, most of you will have been introduced to the symposium team uh, yesterday at the Pitt Rivers. Uh, for anyone that wasn't able to attend that, please look out for uh, John Simpson, Chief Editor of the OED there, Michael Prophet, um, Editorial Project Director, Ed Viner, Deputy Chief Editor over there, Philip Durkin, uh, Principal Etymologist on the project, and of course um, Alice and Jenny at the back who are on hand to offer all the practical help um, with your slides and so on, should you need it. Anyway, it's a busy day, lots to get through, so without further delay, I've got great pleasure in introducing Tim Barton, Managing Director of the Press's Global Academic Division, and he's going to start the day off for us. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Judy. So the picture in front of you has got nothing to do with the uh, so a brief talk I'm going to give, it's just the best picture I came across in uh, looking into this, um, and it sort of starts and ends the, uh, uh, ends the talk. Um, I want to talk about innovation and partnerships uh, in the history of the OED, uh, since in thinking about themes that best summarise what we're looking for from today and to get out of the, uh, out of the symposium, uh, I, I think it, it, it's really those, those, those two themes that best summarise that. Um, I'm going to give a partial and personal view of some of the, the bold decisions, the, the significant innovations, the fortuitous, uh, unexpected meetings of minds from lexicography, publishing and technology that have been important in the history of the OED. Um, I'm hoping, uh, of course, that the symposium can continue that tradition and someone 150 years from now can point back to this symposium as the source of uh, the great next uh, ideas and innovations. Um, uh, I'm delighted too in, uh, in talking about some of those uh, important innovations and partnerships, particularly in the recent history of the OED, uh, to be able to identify the contributions that some of the people in this room today have already made. And uh, I'd like to thank you for those uh, and for all of your contributions and help today in advance. Uh, in order to try and bring kind of some kind of order to the presentation, I've grouped things around sections, editorial ambition, technological partnerships, publishing, media, and outreach. So with that in mind, um, perhaps the, uh, the biggest and boldest innovation, uh, most outrageous innovation in the history of the OED uh, is the idea of the dictionary in, uh, in the first place. Started in 1857 uh, with this outrageous and bold idea, a dictionary of the whole language, past and present, based not on earlier dictionaries or on common knowledge, uh, but on newly gathered supporting evidence. The scope and ambition was clear, but the scale and cost of realizing it unfortunately wasn't. The press put up money to complete the dictionary in 10 years. Five years later, the first faxical A to Ant was published. Uh, a presentation with a different theme might be about how the press has repeatedly failed to understand what it has taken in relation to the OED, what it takes in relation to the OED, and how good a thing that is. Uh, 
From the late 1850s, the OED began to establish its continuous program of language monitoring, a survey of how English is changing internationally, which now serves all Oxford dictionaries. From reading programs to large text corpora to big data and web analytics, OED has sought to find the best means to capture and analyse how English grows and changes, and the most useful way to present this information to its changing readership. With apologies to Richard. Um, OUP gets some credit in the story too, just some. From the outset, the dictionary can also be viewed as a collaboration between OED's editors and OUP's management, and OUP has contributed its share of bold visionary decisions. The project to combine the first edition of the OED with Robert Birchfield's supplements was first proposed in the mid-1980s as a traditional print publishing project, the biggest scissors and paste job in history, in the words of, words of one senior OUP manager. While the ambition to do a second edition was big and bold, this solution wasn't. We're, lo we're not looking for the 2013 equivalent of the biggest paste and scissors job in history today. Uh, Richard Charkin, pictured in here today, was head of reference uh, uh, at OUP in the 1980s. He was one of the first to see the potential of the digital world for dictionaries. He suggested that not only a merger of the two texts, but also a comprehensive revision could be carried out if we were to use an electronic text processing system similar to the one that OUP had installed at the time. Many dictionaries have been written alphabetically, but few are read that way. The digital environment frees readers and editors from the constraints of A to Z sequencing. Hence our decision in 2006 uh, to move OUP editing away from strict alphabetical revision, which at this point had covered letters M to R, to work on keywords and concepts around the whole alphabet. Some of those terms are shown in the first image here, and the second image shows in red the current distribution of revised entries across the OED. With the benefit of hindsight, even though uh, the OED went online in 2000, the fact that it took to, until 2006 to realize that we could um, edit, we, as well as publishing as we went along, we could actually edit out of sequence, is an interesting example of how it, it took us some time to understand how uh, the digital environment freed us from some of the normal practices and processes of the print environment. Uh, the project to digitise OUP was highly collaborative. Moving on to the theme of technology partnerships now, um, an important one. Uh, in an environment where text handling by computer was still a specialised, centralised activity, OUP decided to approach big hardware and software <laughs> companies, as well as academic departments, including the University of Waterloo in Ontario. The OED, uh, the OED was among the first to use uh, SGML as a means to encode text structurally, what you can see on screen here is that first structured view of the text. Tim Bray, manager of the University of Waterloo Centre for the new OED, uh, later became an originator of SGML successor XML. Looking back, Tim noted it would be entirely accurate to say that the work with the OED was a significant input to the development of XML. More luck and more technological innovation. As Ed, uh, as Ed remembers, it was in summer 1983 that Richard Charkin and I did the rounds of numerous computer firms and other agencies. I think it was in, in September that we were at IBM, and they said something like, I'm afraid we can't enter into, into a commercial deal with you, and our hearts sank. But we'll donate you the equipment and the services of a team of software engineers. And we practically fell off our chairs. At that moment, we knew the project was a runner. Uh, uh, Ed fitted in writing a future for the OED, the tender for the computational work while on a family holiday in Devon. This, sets out, this set out the new approach. The electronic handling and delivery of the information contained in and added to the OED. The aim is a new concept of the dictionary as a living and responsive reference book. Back in 1983, that was, that was pretty, pretty innovative thinking. Um, here's a pic of the members of the OUP team and the IBM team with those first computers. Here's another example of how fortuitous and unexpected meetings led to technological innovation. Uh, the Oxford University land agent and acquaintance of Richard Charkins was at a social occasion where he happened to mention the OED project to the president of the University of Waterloo in Canada. The university was building a world reputation in software engineering and, especially, and was especially interested in the handling of large textual databases by computer. The president immediately realized that the OED project would match their interests and offered to collaborate on a non-commercial basis so that they would have access to our electronic text 
and we would have access to all the software that was developed to run on it. Pictured here are Professor Frank Tompa and Gaston Gonet from the University of Waterloo, who partnered with OEP to provide the new software tools, not just to edit the OEP te OED text, but to search it as a database. They also helped define a basic tagging structure with an eye to future information retrieval. In 2002, the OED started working with IDM, uh, a Paris-based software house led by Philippe Clément, uh, pictured here and with us today. Um, IBM designed, uh, IDM designed a new system called Pasadena, which uh, in preparing this talk I learned, uh, I had previously thought it was deeply technical. In fact, it stands for Perfect All Singing, All Dancing Editorial Notation Application. <laughs> it's been a uh, history of some fun on the OED too. Uh, it integrated all of OED's research, editing, and publishing processes using the then new standards uh, XML markup, open source software, and web-based applications. Pasadena automated many routine editing procedures, freeing editors to concentrate on lexicogra lexicographical matters. It allowed full, real-time access to remote workers. Also, by introducing full versioning and tracking of the published content, it freed OED to edit and publish prioritized entries around the A to Z uh, span, and to update the entire publishing text dynamically every three months. Today we'll be asking you for your ideas about how OED can grow and change, both as a dictionary and as a wider language resource. Oxford Dictionary's data is already licensed, significant licensing, to technology companies worldwide, and only for use as, not only for use as conventional dictionaries, but as lexical data underpinning a wide range of applications, services, and devices. Similarly, the OED data could prove valuable for predictive text, search engine lookup, e-reader lookup, particularly for historical texts, spelling and grammar checking, topic-based search and retrieval, data mining, embedded dictionary services, for example, in mobile or telecoms. So that's the technology piece. Uh, now moving on to publishing and publishing innovation. Uh, the OED was also from the outset, has also from the outset been innovative in its choice of publishing formats. Here are some of the original faxicals. Um, although serial publication was widely used at the time for works of reference as well as for fiction, the, the scope and depth of the OED's work captured people's imagination. The writer, Arnold Bennett, described it as the longest sensational serial ever written. <laughs> Here was another bold publishing solution to tackle the scale and size of the OED. The, mi uh, the micrographic edition, first published in 1971, may look quaint now, but at the time responded to the need for, uh, of a wider public to have access to the OED, perhaps a, a wider public with, with smaller houses and fewer shelves. Um, surprisingly, this edition actually remains in print, and we still regularly receive requests for replacement magnifying glasses. Uh, I love this photo. Uh, it's a rather imposing photo of co-editors John Simpson and Edmund Viner was taken by Lord Snowden during a long afternoon's photo shoot as a studio in North London. It's the earliest manifestation of the digital text was the OED on CD-ROM, first produced in 1988, predating the existence of Windows, and this was, this was taken to celebrate that. Um, I, I thought it was Don Draper when I, when I, when I first saw it. <laughs> the, the, the mad men of the o, o, OED. Um, when the World Wide Web appeared 20 years ago, we quickly thought of the potential for the OED, but the online audience for such a site was then unknowable. To those most uh, closely involved in the project, there were a few precedents which made it both exciting and risky. Uh, Mike Lesk of Bell Labs, a great ally of, uh, of, of OED, told us not to worry, if you build it, they will come, he said. Uh, Jeffrey Triggs, at the time director of OED's North American Reading Program, had proposed and piloted a web-based Oxford Online Electronic Tech Center in the mid-1990s, containing the OED as the flagship resource. Jeffrey commented, we were easily among the first 400 sites on the web. In addition, Jeffrey had the forethought to register the OED.com domain. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, eventually, that led to the launch of OED Online in March 2000, when the OED became the first major national historical dictionary to present itself on the internet using software developed by Stanford University's Highwire Press, and it was the first to be updatable, adding new material from the revision progress, uh, program every three months. In 2010, we uh, undertook a complete rebuild of the website, incorporating new features and functionality. We also took a decision to republish the entire text as we revise and not wait till work was complete. 
That allowed readers to see the numerous bibliographical and stylistic standardizations we had introduced in otherwise unrevised entries, thereby enhancing internal consistency and searchability. But the most significant change was the integration of the then recently published historical thesaurus of the OED. The historical th thesaurus could be described as another form of long-term, long-distance collaboration. The, the thesaurus is the extraordinary work, work result of 40 years of work by a team at the University of Glasgow, represented here by Mark Alexander. Uh, in its digital form, linked to the OED, this allows users of the website an entirely new way to access the history of English by allowing them to choose a subject or theme and open up the historical vista of related words. As David Crystal remarked, the OED gave us individual trees, but never a sight of the whole forest or helpful pathways through it. The, the thesaurus does precisely that. Finally, outreach is the, the fourth, the, fourth theme. OED was from the very start conceived of as a collaborative enterprise reaching out to the wider public. Sometimes described as the first wiki, it's probably more accurate to say OED was crowdsourcing 150 years or so before the term existed. Uh, this research project devoted to the language uh, of science fiction was set up online in 2002 so that knowledgeable aficionados could help the OED find useful examples of, wo of words in their field of interest. We're now planning similar projects in other areas of interest and expertise. A new online appeals program was launched last year to tap into the skills of word detectives worldwide. Most popular, the most popular appeal to date was the blue arsed fly. The earliest use of the phrase was originally attributed by OED to the Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, I think we were courting royal popularity. Um, uh, but was traced through the appeal back a further 35 years to its origins of Navy slang, which is perhaps where the Duke picked it up. Uh, so before I, I turn to, to Judy, um, final slide, uh, back to that fantastic picture. Uh, the OED is the largest and, and longest running scholarly project in the world. It's adapted extremely well over its 150 year history, both through internal and external uh, innovation and, and partnerships. I think throughout the history there have been some, some really bold decisions uh, to digitize in the 1980s and to partner with leading edge technologies to achieve that, to revise the entire text looking at new evidence, new scholarship and using new techniques and technology, to publish the entire text online as a work in progress before Wikipedia had appeared, then to keep updating the text so that users could benefit from new research and scholarship as it develops. The challenge for the OED is to keep adapting itself for new existing and new readers, um, which is in part why you're here today. Um, I'm now going to introduce uh, Judy, who's going to talk about some of the, the thinking and work we've been doing over the last year or two in terms of ideas we've been developing um, in order to provide, provide some kind of helpful contemporary framing for the discussion today. So thank you for your time. Over to Judy. Well, thanks very much, Tim, for that um, uh, whirlwind tour of uh, the past of the OED. Um, I'm going to um, talk a little bit more about the present and the future. Um, the OED Symposium is a key part of our planning for the future. In November 2012, the press uh, approved a new 10-year plan. This doesn't, these things don't happen frequently. This is designed to take the project beyond its current position in the digital world to a position that embraces and integrates with the digitized world in a broader sense. And this is about making, uh, meeting our core objective of researching and disseminating the English language and its history um, in even more, making that even more realizable. So what we did in the plan was that we defined four strategic directions redefine a user-based editorial focus, which really means, given it's such a long-running project, thinking always about our users, prioritizing our editorial work, involving our users as we go, developing OED data and language technology, focusing delivery on user needs and benefits, so making sure that the OED is in the places where it's most useful, integrating with other 
data and services, whether that's in the Kindle when you're reading a historical novel or within a historical database when you're researching the history of the language. Developing new markets and revenues. That may mean thinking about the growing appetite for English in new regional markets such as India and China, for example. It may mean extending our global coverage. It may mean licensing content and data from the OED to third parties. How can the OED serve these new markets? And in the next couple of slides, I'm going to highlight a few of the projects arising from these strategic directions. So the first is a very important one, the new core vocabulary project. So we've talked about moving away from alphabetical editing, but the core vocabulary project focuses on terms together with their 200,000 associated uh, meanings with the highest frequency in contemporary English. And that also means coincidentally and fortuitously, we also are prioritizing the words that are um, searched most frequently for in OED Online, that are most prolific in terms of new senses, phrases and compounds, and most in need of repair. So putting those at the forefront of our editorial work. Many of those frequently used words, here's some of the top 20 in the, uh, from the Oxford English corpus, of course, as you can see, date back to old English and early modern English. And that's a real challenge for us because those are the most challenging entries to do. So we've really got a, a job to do in balancing the work on that with the other things that we do to make sure we can manage it. Second um, project I want to talk about, our audio pronunciation project, which brings much needed audio um, dimension to the OED. The OED contains currently 186,000 entries which have a text-based IPA pronunciation. And our initial focus is on recording 60,000 audio files for extant vocabulary where no audio file currently exists in the rest of our dictionary holdings. It's a really significant amount of work. It's a lengthy process. It's very technical um, from recruitment of actors to the recording to the final sound file. This is the sound engineer, a guy called Gary Lester, who's um, editing, segmenting and naming the sound files um, after it's all come out of the sound studio. Tim's touched on this already, but there are experts and enthusiasts in specialists and technical fields all over the world who know about the history of words in their field. We want to work with those people. Um, we've mentioned already the OED appeals, and we're looking to grow that, um, to, to extend that and make that more um, perhaps thematic um, based. OED Communities um, is a project to engage, uh, it's a series of projects to engage web communities with specialist knowledge and draw on their expertise to help us with our research and writing the dictionary. And we're building on that early experiment with science fiction that Tim mentioned, and we're collaborating with uh, Danica Salazar, um, who's here today, our Mellon Fellow in English Language at the university here, to launch a community initiative for Philippines English later this year. I've put um, their OED wiki with a question mark, so a version of the text that can be annotated um, perhaps by invited or vetted external parties. This is kind of on our wish list at the moment, but it's yet to be realized. How should we do it? Developing OED data, I'm just gonna mention some of the projects here. Developing OED data has become a key focus for the Dictionary Department's Language Technology Group. And the starting point was the development of something we've called the Global English Lexicon, a comprehensive and central repository of forms from um, the English lexicon. Um, some of the projects that are building on that, uh, and I won't say too much about them because I know that James McCracken, who's here today, is going to be touching on some of those in his talk um, later. He's been working closely with us on these projects, but frequency marking. So using various inputs, um, both from the OED itself, but also from, for example, Google Engrams, to band OED entries by frequency overall and over time. Currency marking. So um, while we've got this um, text that is half revised and not revised, importing currency information from modern dictionaries and corpora in order to mark unrevised entries that are still current, even when the latest quotation material may suggest otherwise. 
We've got a lot of work going on new words as well around building an integrated lexical management system to semi-automate and help manage tracking and monitoring of new terms. Um, that's, a, that's a big project that's moving along um, at the moment. And lastly, again, question mark, stub entries. One of the outputs of the uh, new words system uh, could be, um, we hope will be, uh, stub entries that will show some of our work in progress before we've had uh, the chance to fully revise those entries. Uh, that's just a, a kind of a view of one word um, in, the, in the maelstrom of all the words, um, pest, um, the badger in the sense of pestering someone. So these are the kinds of things that we're discovering with the um, uh, frequency project. So many people have been involved and continue to be involved in the OED. We're, again, I want to say delighted to welcome you all here today to help us answer some of these questions. These are the questions that are in the uh, parallel um, discussions and to rise to the challenge of trying to answer those questions. So we are now, and I'm just in time, um, going to move into the first series of parallel sessions. Um, I just want to say a, a little word about those. We've deliberately given over a lot of time today to parallel sessions. Our thinking is more speakers and as many perspectives as possible, plus smaller groups to encourage discussion. We realize that means you can't go to all the talks. Um, so just, I think as you know, we're filming the entire event and the videos um, will be made available to you all online after the symposium. So we've got a lot to get through. So um, without further ado, I think all that's left for me to say is um, enjoy yourselves. Hope you have a really enjoyable and stimulating day. Um, do tell us your thoughts. And um, as I say, do enjoy yourself. And thank you.